This video will explore topics 1.4 through 1.7, the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and hydrologic cycle. All of the elements that are important in constructing the molecules of life circulate in a cyclical nature through different processes as they participate in chemical reactions. These cycles are called biogeochemical cycles. If we were to keep track of the movement of a given atom, it can sometimes be found incorporated in the molecules found in living things, or found in the minerals that make up different kinds of rocks, or as inorganic substances found in water and air. And don't forget, of course, that water also cycles through ecosystems. The first cycle we're going to explore involves carbon. Carbon atoms are important in every major category of biomolecule. They're necessary for carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. How an inorganic carbon compound like carbon dioxide is incorporated into living things involves photosynthesis. Photosynthetic organisms, also known as producers or autotrophs, obtain carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and by using the sun's energy, construct organic molecules through a series of photosynthetic reactions. The producer can then use those organic molecules for its own growth and reproduction, or they can be stored for later use. On the other hand, consumers, like herbivores, can eat the plant material to obtain those organic molecules for themselves. Other kinds of consumers, like omnivores and carnivores, can obtain those organic molecules by eating plants or animals, or just by eating other animals, respectively. Like any cycle, we can choose any point on this diagram to begin tracking the movement of carbon atoms. Some of the key features of the carbon cycle include how carbon is released into the atmosphere, as well as how it's removed from the atmosphere, how carbon can be stored in carbon sinks, and how humans are influencing the carbon cycle. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration are two processes that have been occurring for millions of years, removing and returning carbon to the atmosphere. Oceans and forests can act as carbon sinks, locations where carbon can be stored for long periods of time. Another carbon sink involves the formation of fossil fuels. Over tens of millions of years, decaying organic material forms into oil, coal, and natural gas. Up until the Industrial Revolution, these fossil fuels were excluded from circulation in the carbon cycle. However, with the discovery that those fuels could be used as an energy source, those stored carbon compounds were extracted from the earth and combusted. It's this combustion of fossil fuels that has increased the quantity of carbon, mainly in the form of carbon dioxide, released into the atmosphere. The second cycle we're going to explore involves nitrogen. Nitrogen is found in the amino acids that are used to construct proteins. Nitrogen is also necessary in the formation of the nucleotides that are used to build DNA and RNA. Like carbon in the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycles between living things and the environment as well. By far, the largest repository of nitrogen is the atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is comprised of a number of gases, 78% of which is nitrogen. Nitrogen gas, however, cannot directly be used by living things. It first must be converted into a usable ionic form like ammonium ions or nitrate ions. This process, called nitrogen fixation, is primarily the responsibility of only two kinds of bacteria, collectively called nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Once the nitrogen is in a usable form, they can be taken up into the plants through their roots, whereby plants then incorporate the nitrogen into amino acids and nucleotides. Just like carbon, those nitrogen compounds can be used by the plants or passed on to animals if the plants are eaten. Humans have influenced the nitrogen cycle through the production of synthetic fertilizers, which contain nitrogen. 
the introduction of excess nitrogen into ecosystems has ecological consequences that will be explored in a later topic. The final biogeochemical cycle we're going to take a look at is the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is found in a variety of organic molecules. It is important in the sugar phosphate backbone of nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. It is also necessary to construct the molecule used to build cell membranes, the phospholipid. And it is also found in ATP, the molecule used by cells as an energy source. The phosphorus cycle shares many similarities with the carbon and nitrogen cycles. There are, however, a few notable differences. One is the fact that the phosphorus cycle does not have a significant atmospheric component. That means that it's found either dissolved in water, or as part of the mineral content of certain rocks, or within living things. Another difference revolves around how phosphorus is released from rock into the environment. With the exception of the phosphorus that is found in human-made fertilizers, the release of phosphorus from rock involves the very slow, millions of years long process of weathering and erosion. As we saw with nitrogen, plants uptake phosphorus and incorporate it into their biomass for their use, or it could be transferred to the animals if it is consumed. Also, like nitrogen, humans have interfered with the phosphorus cycle through the production and use of fertilizers. The consequences of that interference will be explored in a later topic. It is important to note at this point that all elements have their own biogeochemical cycles. Calcium, iron, magnesium, etc. all cycle between living things and the environment. But because elements like those are required by living things in relatively much smaller concentrations, we won't be studying them in any detail. Although water is a molecule and not an element, understanding how it cycles is important. Since you first learned about the hydrologic or water cycle in a science class years ago, this is a good opportunity for a quick review. This cycle is primarily driven by the evaporation powered by the sun's energy. And water can be found in any of its three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. The overwhelming majority of water on Earth is found in the oceans, with only a small proportion, about 3%, existing as fresh water. Most of that fresh water is frozen in the form of glaciers and polar ice caps. Less than 1% of 3% is fresh water in liquid form on the surface of the Earth. We say that the water cycle is driven by the sun's energy because evaporation is what converts liquid water into water vapor found in the atmosphere. This water vapor then condenses as liquid water, which can also freeze to form ice, to create clouds. Some form of precipitation then falls, travels downhill thanks to gravity, on the surface of the earth or underground, ultimately making its way back to oceans or lakes. That liquid water is then available for evaporation again, and the cycle goes on. Humans don't really have a direct influence on the hydrologic cycle. However, because of climate change and the resulting increase in the Earth's average temperatures, an indirect consequence of that is the evaporation of greater amounts of water into the atmosphere. Atmospheric and climate change scientists use computer models to predict how climate and weather patterns may change in the future as a result of more water vapor in the atmosphere. That concludes this video on our look into cycles, so until next time, take care.